uh, we will discuss many interesting and challenging questions of our times that you as a writer, as a futurist, are definitely fascinated by. First of all, I, I'd like to recommend to everyone your books, uh, perfect must reads, uh, I think for everyone interested in uh, the current uh, issues of the world and uh, especially in sci-fi genre. So thanks for writing them, I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. And the first question I'd like to ask is uh, about the technology behind those books, because I know that in one of your stories you used AI to write a portion of the text. Will it be a dominating technique for future writers to use AI for their stories? And will the AI maybe replace in the future uh, human uh, writers of uh, flesh and blood? Right, so I started to use AI as a collaborator uh, since 2017. So that was actually the year when Google launched uh, the algorithm uh, transformer and BERT, B-E-R-T. So during these four years actually has a lot of progress uh, happening in the industry level. For example, uh, OpenAI launched uh, GBT, which is uh, super powerful pre-train uh, algorithm, uh, you, you already read a lot from the news. So we started using them, uh, GPT-2, to learn how to write science fiction. So right now I have this kind of um, AI model, like study my writing style, and I can use it to generate it some paragraph uh, automatically. But I have to say, it's the way to go until you uh, until you can really have the machine write something fluent and as natural as chi uh, human writers can do. For now, I can only pick some sentence and put it into my own uh, writing, so make it as a whole. So I think it's not pure AI. Uh, generative uh, writing for now, but I think in the future, in a pretty long period of time, AI could be a very powerful assistant uh, for human creators. For example, when you want to check any specific terms which might refer to some uh, specific uh, classic uh, works in the history, so AI definitely can help you to do that. So just like a search engine, and another example is like it knows better than you do how you gonna use all these uh, nouns and verbs and how you combine all these kind of words and what's your habit when you're using something on description, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's the way how writers gonna understanding how ourselves like on writing style. So that's help us to break through the framework, our momentum. Mm -hmm. on writing. So there always something come out from the AI surprised me because I didn't think I can think from that perspective, but it always give me some new inspiration that I might sometimes follow its direction. For example, it give me a sentence like, actually the Mars is the opposite side of the Earth. So if we want to travel from the Earth to the Mars, actually you don't need to take the spacecraft, you just need to uh, flip over the paper just from one side to the other one. It's just like folding the space time. So that's something really hit me because I didn't think in that way. So maybe in the future, in the, I think in that case, maybe someday AI will be a real writers on some way, maybe win a Nobel Prize award, who knows? Well, as you mentioned, paradoxically, the AI may help us better understand ourselves and our thinking process. So that's uh, quite interesting. You mentioned GPT-2 uh, by OpenAI, a subsidiary of Google, as far as I know. Uh, have you ever played with GPT-3, the most powerful neural network uh, generating texts as of today? Because uh, as far as I know, uh, and I've, uh, I've played with it a little bit, I've been given access by uh, a tech expert. 
uh, in this area, and it's really impressive. It's hundreds of times better than GPT-2, and it produces texts that are almost indistinguishable from uh, human texts. So it passes the Turing test easily. So have you have you tried it? Right, I didn't try because it didn't open access to uh, Chinese uh, users yet, but. I think there's some um, Chinese tech companies, they try to build up some model like equivalent to GPT-3 using all these kind of Chinese uh, materials across the internet. So I did try that myself. It's kind of like astonishing, as you mentioned. So I'm pretty looking forward because right now I think as like GPT-3 or even like something more advanced might open up to public use for some uh, academic people, uh, researchers, so they can use it like uh, with uh, limited uh, uh, assess. So I think there's a lot of possibilities there for people like me and even like doing this kind of like uh, academic uh, research can use GPT-2 to create some very interesting projects in the future. So I'm pretty looking forward to that kind of collaboration. You say you're looking forward to those types of collaboration, but are you not afraid uh, that the AI will replace you? Maybe the AI will be better uh, in generating new plots, uh, new ideas, because it's more powerful, uh, and human writers will become extinct. As a human writer, I think the most important thing and the most irreplaceable thing is your unique voice and the way how you see the world and because this is all from our personal pers uh, perspective our perception of the world our private experience our childhood etc etc so all those uh, require a lot uh, a huge amount of like uh, embodiment uh, connection which my for now i didn't think any kind of ai or machine can reach that point not in the I don't know in the next 20 years so you first you need to build a body for the AI and build up all these kind of super sophisticated uh, sensories and not to mention we have to build up the whole perception uh, system for the machine for the algorithm so I think all of those still be the privilege of human beings so I'm not afraid of being taken, being replaced by AI as a creator, but I'm thinking about like actually AI can help us to go beyond, beyond the binary because we are still limited in our human body, in our human uh, individual uh, perspective, but maybe AI as a something very object, objective function, optimization, driven algorithm it might go beyond that kind of binary so i'm pretty much i think it's not challenging i think it's opportunity for all of us so i'm pretty much i'm embracing it i'm not afraid to be taken over mm -hmm. i see so you are a techno optimist so am I. Uh, let's go for the better uh, outcome. Let's uh, talk about uh, the AI development in general. Uh, you've, re you've recently co-authored a book, uh, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future, with, uh, jointly with Kai Fu Lee. Uh, you provide uh, several scenarios of the future dominated by the AI. Uh, you definitely uh, have heard of uh, some scientists uh, claiming that um, some of those scenarios may lead to our doomsday, to uh, even the extinction of humanity as a whole, because the super intelligent AI uh, may um, destroy us, may uh, use uh, humans, for example, as resources. Uh, what do you think of uh, such scenarios? How likely? are they and how we can prevent them, if we can. Yeah, I think uh, before we already read and watched so many uh, dystopian stories from uh, science fiction and movies like Terminators, uh, Ex Machina, 
2001 Space Odyssey, uh, all those images of AI and robots are pretty much hostile, bleak, competitive. So they're trying so hard to dominate human being and even like uh, human extinction, like, uh, uh, like, like uh, afterward. But in our book, I think is really unlikely to have that kind of scenario happen over the next 20 years because we think the technology is not even close to that kind of like self-generated uh, consciousness of AI yet. So in the book, actually we talk about a little bit of like a post apocalypse scenario about autonomous uh, with weapon, yeah. which but also like creates and initiate by human. So actually, I think in the in the next twenty years, AI will be an amplifier of humanity no matter it's like from the positive way or from the negative way because it's so powerful but now it seems like it's kind of by design to be a very recursively calculating um, um, algorithm so it's just self enhancement so I think it will build up all these kind of bad things in humanity even on social media and also uh, uh, everywhere. But I think the real problem is how we can come up with some, no matter it's like regulation, law enforcement, or on the algorithmic uh, level, how we can recorrect all this kind of bias and discrimination because all this kind of data set, they might have bias, they might have blind spots. So how we can have this kind of AI really serve for everyone, but not for those privileged people, for those AI superpower countries, but for everyone, individual, equally on this planet Earth. As much important as like it should play a very important role to uh, fight against the climate change and the biodiversity extinction as well. So all this kind of thing is what we are discussing in the book. Yeah, that is the question. Uh, if we can cope with uh, uh, the inequality uh, escalated by the development of the AI. But let me reiterate the question uh, regarding the future. I see that you don't believe uh, that uh, within 20 years uh, the AI will become sentient. But what about the longer time span? Is it possible for the AI to become conscious and uh, maybe overpower and rule the humankind? Right, so that tap into the area how we define consciousness and how we define intelligence. So I think uh, it's, it, is not, uh, it is unnecessary to have some kind of agency with intelligence have to uh, create some kind of self-consciousness. For example, like uh, the mobile phone, the laptop, any kind of smart devices we're using every day. You can call it some kind of non-consciousness intelligence agency for now. But as so far as uh, we might know nothing about like how consciousness is really from like the uh, human neural uh, network level, how it emerges from uh, chaos. So I think maybe in the future it is quite possible because if we accumulate enough amount of like uh, gigaton uh, uh, gigabyte uh, of data and we somehow manage to have itself generate some kind of like order it's just like uh, emergence or a complexity uh, perspective so it could come up with something pretty similar with what we so call the consciousness right now. But I'm not sure if that is the same thing as we understand human consciousness for now, because it might be something totally different. It might see the world, see the life form, see the civilization from a totally different perspective. So um, I don't think maybe it will go as human expected or afraid of like 
take over the world, like conquering all our human species, or like erasing us, like uh, the whole uh, 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 civilization from the, the, the planet. But maybe it will take us as something totally different. For example, it might totally be indifferent with who we are, what we are doing. It just pure exist. Just I remember as the ancient Chinese Taoism philosophy mm-hmm. said like the, the, the heaven and the earth is totally indifferent. It just doesn't care any kind of species exist on the planet. It just let it go. So I think maybe that could be the thing which was described in uh, Stanis Lamb's uh, Lamb's uh, Solarius which was one of my favorite science fiction. So it actually described that scenario. Yeah, it's a really beautiful proverb that you mentioned. So as you correctly, in my opinion, perfectly correctly said, uh, the problem is uh, that we don't know actually what uh, consciousness is, even for humans. We have not uh, uh, defined, uh, we, we have not a universally agreed definition of what it is. So how, how to measure whether the AI is conscious or not? Uh, that's the question. Well, philosophers have been grappling with it for de- decades. Maybe, maybe we will see in our lifespans the resolution of this issue. What do you think uh, of the current uh, situation in the world with the ecology, with the global warming? Will we be able to overcome it, to cope with it? I hope it is not getting too late because I'm pretty much closely following uh, all the stuff happening in Scotland, the COP26, so see if anything concrete happening. So, yeah, I have to say the goal is pretty challenging, even like for China to set up this kind of goal for reach carbon neutrality on 2016 60 is pretty challenging because we are so much rely on the fossil energy so uh, is the foundation of our modern civilization so i think it requires a lot of like radical breakthrough te- technologically and like green uh, clean energy and how to storage those energies, for example, from the sun, from the wind. And right now, I think we're still not there yet because the material science is didn't find out anything um, with higher capacity and more efficiency than lithium. And that's the bottleneck how uh, to stop us from like uh, massively using this kind of green energy. And also we're pretty much looking forward to the uh, uh, implementation of uh, uh, fusion energy, which might always 50 years away from now. So it's almost become a joke, but uh, like people are trying so hard in China and also all around the world. So I think unless those areas uh, problem was solved we are so difficult to uh, reverse all this kind of damage uh, causing by the uh, fossil energy industry and all this kind of carbon emission by brought by human activity all around the world over the previous hundreds of years so as we all experience, the climate change is becoming even more extreme to, uh, this year. So I think also the Nobel Prize on physics was giving to complexity uh, science who uh, uh, precisely uh, predicted the relationship, the current correlation between the global warming mm-hmm. with uh, human economic activities. So that means we are actually found the proof that nobody can deny. So the rest of the thing is how are we going to solve it? So because it's all across different geopolitical issues and different ideology across different societies, we need to try very hard to create this kind of consensus. Then we can make a 
small step forward. However, like uh, I think on the agreement of Co. Twenty Six, I think the it's kind of conservative and it's kind of disappointing mm-hmm. to me. And because people are being too cautious, being too conservative on making the move. So I think if we don't make the radical move, I think there's not that much time left for us, like every one of us on this planet. So I'm pretty hope there will be some science fictional turning point ahead of us to happen, which might totally save the world. But yeah, who knows? Yeah, let's hope that we invent something before it's too late, because... uh... The issue, <laughs> right. um, the issue is colossal. Uh, would you agree to transfer in your consciousness uh, into the digital world if it were possible? Would you become a digital entity inside a machine? So that's about digital immortality. That's, uh, uh, some transhumanists, some futurists say it's possible. Others say it, it is not. What do you think about that? So I think what what I'm gonna do is make a copy of myself, like and upload it or transfer it into anywhere uh, in the virtual world or into a, a, a machine body. So because you never know if it's gonna work. But meanwhile, I'm thinking about maybe our consciousness is some kind of quantum effect with entanglement. When I got the point that I can. Um, make a copy of myself and tr- transfer in somewhere else. Alternatively, maybe we have built up this kind of like like a entanglement between the two entities. So I can totally feel how it feels in the virtual world or in a like machine body. So I think that's even better, right? Because right now I can enjoy like double life. So that's my like selfish thinking. <laughs> so uh, the positive side of it is that you can be uh, at two points uh, at the same time, right? Uh, in the digital world, uh, learn about things, uh, live there, and also experience the real life in flesh. Uh, right. Are there any drawbacks? Drawbacks. I think when I'm getting to old or some incurable disease, like I'll definitely go uh, virtual, so yeah, that's the way how you make the longevity, and yeah, why not? Just give it a shot. If you had uh, to choose, uh, let's uh, uh, imagine a possible scenario of the future uh, where you can have uh, physical immortality, uh, longevity, etc. Uh, or you can choose, uh, you can opt for a digital immortality, uh, live forever mm-hmm. in the cloud. Which one would you choose? Fundamentally, they're the same. When you have this kind of like immortality, so no matter is in physical world or in the digital world, they're fundamentally the same because when you live long enough, you will find a way to connect, to break through all this kind of different plans. So across all this uh, binaries and boundaries, uh, because you have this kind of eternity, life and time. So there's nothing you can do, but keep developing your uh, intelligence and your technology. Then ultimately, I think the final question is whether there is like boundaries of our universe and if there is what is outside of it and the next question is if there's a creator of above of us all because i know russia is a very uh, catholic um, society okay. yeah. uh, correct me correct me if i got it wrong so i think the ultimate question is who created us and what's the purpose if this universe created us, so what's the purpose? So that's a very rational thinking, but I think that's the ultimate question for all civilization and in intelligence species in the world. Which traditional world trends 
and genres in literature gave you the platform for synthesizing uh, your model of the future? Right now, I'm really thinking about like I, I'm revisiting a lot of myth, mythology, and folklore, and even like Greek uh, mythologies. So I definitely found a lot of like um, wisdom and philosophy for sure in those ancient um, thousand years ago. Uh, words and stories and narratives. So I think definitely there are so many uh, things there still waiting us to reconnect with them. And I think maybe the solution of like, all this kind of problem we're facing nowadays is there. Because in China, we have this kind of old saying from Taoism like um, um, Tian he Yi. So the, the individual with the cosmos is actually united and they are the one. So I think this actually is a very simple expression of like how we human uh, species should uh, coexist in a harmonious way with other species on the planet rather than exploiting all the nature and other species and that causing all, uh, so many ecological environmental problems. So I think that's totally something like our ancestor already aware of thousand years ago, but now it seems to for forget all of those. So I think that's something always reminds me, you have to bear it in mind, like those people, our ancestors, they are not barbarians but there's someone might be way smarter than us. So yeah, that's totally fascinating. Well, uh, by reading your books, you can see that you have deep respect for traditional uh, Chinese culture and um, it's really unique and interesting. All those proverbs that you quote, marvelous, marvelous. Will books uh, become interactive in future? Uh, will there be uh, problematic to print books uh, in the traditional format? Will the uh, interactive new form of uh, book publishing prosper? I think the book with pure test format will be less and less and maybe just for some um, very well-educated, privileged people, um, collectors, but as everyone might see right now is getting into the era of like games like gamification so everything could become a game so the game is actually rooted on some kind of narrative storytelling so it's also like about literature and 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 fiction for sure so but it requires a lot of different uh intermediate uh format to to express all these kind of ideas so I think totally in the future, we might have this kind of books or whatsoever you call it, but we can, we will be able to interact, to be engaged in a, in a very immersive way or even in the metaverse. So you can still read, it can, you, can exper you can experience it. You can even like using the new neural link to directly connect your sensation into uh, someone else's memories or experience or his narratives. So I think there's some new way of reading for sure. And I, I, I couldn't see why not, because that's what we human beings always pursuing like over thousands of years, we're pursuing more and more realistic experience we have bigger screens we have higher definition we have more interaction uh interfaces etc etc this is all like like pursuing closer and closer to our uh, physical experience in this world i wonder how such books would look like uh, in metaverse for those of the viewers who don't know uh, metaverse is a VR universe to be created in future, supposedly by um, technological giants of our time. Uh, Facebook, which has been renamed as Meta, or maybe its competitors. So uh, 
my question is, uh, what would be the difference? Books in metaverse, will there be, I don't know, uh, some uh, AR, VR letters floating around you, or how will they look? What do you think? For now, the limitation is our imagination. So because everything is digital in metaverse, so it's not necessary to be a book. It could be anything. It could be a toy. It could be an uh, android shape of person, or it, can, it, it could be a theme park. So, but like it's doing everything right now we're doing on a book. Like we, we can read it. We can using our imagination to uh, filling the gap, and we can interact with them. So totally, there's uh, there's another way of saying we're playing a video game. I think it's much more immersive because right now we need to this kind of like uh, mobile phone. We have an interface which is quite obviously block us from the reality. But in the metaverse, it means like uh, just uh, basically think about like uh, Ready Player One. So everyone can put on the goggle and wearing the, the haptic uh, suits and, and get into the world with all this kind of very uh, authentic uh, simulation of different sensories. So I think at that point, you have no way to tell which is reality which is virtual and that means there there is like infinite possibilities on storytelling because you can do whatever you like but there comes another question will you be too addicted for people because right now people are so addicted to your cell phone to the video games right so it's become the new drug fundamentally so i think it's changing our uh, um neural system is like kind of distraction for sure. It creates a lot of questions which still have no clear answer yet. So I'm pretty much looking forward to see how this brave new world will turn out and how everyone, including the, the government, the tech giants, and each individual might react and interact with this new way of existence yeah it's scary and captivating at the same time uh you mentioned uh, interactive uh, novels interactive fiction uh, it is uh, a kind of storytelling that's i think uh, already been used by uh, some creators in cinema mostly and in video games for example um, some of our viewers uh, might have seen the Black Mirror episode called Bandersnatch, where the viewers of this uh, Netflix series uh, could choose right. the actions of the characters, uh, which uh, would determine the outcome of the story. Uh, do you know of any um, books which uh, you could recommend inside genre, interactive fiction, but in books? I think there are some for kids, so they give you some options when you come to certain story uh, uh, plot lines uh, on certain points, you can make the decision which direction you want to go and it makes you to turn over to certain pages mm -hmm. and continue the plot. So I think there are so many books about that, but I I couldn't quite recall anyone, uh, anyone because I read those books when I'm pretty young, like around 10 or so. But I think there's one book about like describing all this kind of interactive like books is The Diamond Age from Neil Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So maybe many of you might know he also created the term Avatar and Metaverse yeah, in Snow Crash. Yeah, he's super famous. He's like creating all this kind of fancy words, and he's always my one of my writing idols. So I think that book actually set in future Shanghai and talking about like how this kind of interactive book might change the kids like from this kind of interaction and direct them to unfold their future of possibilities, which is totally totally amazing. 
which book is your favor favorite in the genre of uh, sci-fi? Which is uh, uh, which book would you call a must read? Uh, the one that everybody has to read. Right, there are so many must reads and classic and favorite ones. One of my favorite is Sorari's von Lam. I just mentioned previously, mm -hmm. and also like uh, uh, Pinnick at the roadside is mm -hmm. from uh, Russian. Stugat. So and also I think yep. And 2001 Space Odyssey from Arthur C. Clarke and um, Ubik from Philip K. Dick. So I think those are all classic and my all-time favorite. Okay, do you read any other books uh, except uh, sci-fi? Um, recently I read a, a fantastic book uh, named uh, Nova Scene by James Lovelock. The British scientists uh, who brought up with the term Gaia back in the 60s. So this book was uh, published in 19, uh, 2019. So that's the year when James in his 99. So this book is actually talking about like Anthropocene. So the human civilization is just a transmission to the next level, Novacene which is a pure silicon-based species civilization, which is way more efficient on energy and information level. So he thinks that's the ultimate purpose of the universe is to create some kind of consciousness which can have this kind of dialogue with the universe itself. So that's a very, I, I, I couldn't say crazy because it's not a science fiction. It's yeah. a popular science book. So I think it's even crazier than most of the science fiction I've ever read. Well, the craziness of our reality exceeds uh, anything that could be invented by uh, even science fiction writers, uh, I think. Uh, okay, so this new era of humankind is called the Nova Scene, right? For, 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 right. those, for those who misheard. Would you think that it uh, is problematic if the AI starts positioning itself as a person? I think uh, this question uh, continues our discussion about the AI uh, in, the, in the direction that if the AI uh, becomes, let's say, conscious, uh, whatever we mean by that, uh, it may require some legal rights, there will be ethical questions, uh, etc., etc. Right, I believe like previous this year or last year, like Europe, EU, they are really serious discussing the uh, rights, like the human rights for robots and AI, but I don't think there's anything like convincing coming out. So I think it depends how we define like a, a like an um, agency with this kind of a, a, a autonomy and with this kind of legitimacy on like self determined uh, behavior on a legal level. So I think that's totally something very complex. It requires different inputs from uh, interdisciplinaries. So I think that's not only from the tech perspective, but for all humanities. I see. Uh, unfortunately, I'm being told that we have run out of time.